We cannot turn our back on them, and we should not turn our back on them. And I'm committed to working as aggressively as we possibly can with CIPIC to take the most expansive possible view of how to, how to replay the, repay these claims and to do it in, in as quick a fashion as they possibly can. Um, but I agree that we need to push very hard to make people whole to the greatest extent possible. Uh, First question. Uh, are either of you aware of any instance in which CIPIC has defined net, net equity the way the trustee is doing in this case? Uh, Ms. Coffey and then Ms. Bain. Do you want to go first? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, I can assure this committee that there has never been a case in a SIPA liquidation where SIPIC or the SEC has taken the position that SIPIC does not have to comply with the law. This is the first time in SIPIC's history that SIPIC has taken the position that net equity as defined by Congress does not apply to SIPIC. First question. As, as I understand it, uh, brokers, um, investment advisors um, are required to put into the fund to be covered by SIPIC $150. That is not correct. Currently, the assessments uh, by our bylaw require each brokerage firm to, uh, to be assessed one quarter of one percent of their net operating revenues. When we started uh, paying Madoff claims, we instituted effective April 1st assessments based on revenues rather than Beginning a when? Fee. April 1st. Before that, it was $150? When we reached $1 billion, which our risk managers... Yeah, but before, before Madoff, it was $150? When we reached the figure of 100... I, I don't have a lot of time left, so if we could just focus on a couple of more questions. The answer was based on revenues until 1990, when we reached a billion dollars, then from 1990 through uh, April of this year, it was a flat fee of $150. Mr. Chapman, you said, look, uh, just to get into the weeds on one little, not a little point, but one point in some of the material you supplied us with, you said that the trustee, correct me if I'm wrong, the trustee and CIPIC are running administrative expenses of approximately $100 million per year, um, but Mr. Harbeck says in his testimony that the trustees have only paid $1.2 million um, so far. Can you well, I think I, I, I can clarify that. that, yeah. Yes, the, the trustees' legal fees are... Hit I'm your little sorry. button. I'm sorry. The trustees' legal fees have been approved for the first 15 weeks at the rate of a million dollars a week. He then filed an application for another 23 weeks, and he's running again at a million dollars a week. So if you project that for a year, it would be $50 million a year. And uh, Mr. Harbeck has said publicly that the non-legal fees, the forensic accountants, et cetera, who are going back through generations to figure out the net investment, which of course is not required by the statute, Mr. Harbeck had said in the press that those expenses are running at the rate of a million dollars a week. Right. So it's one of those cases, as a typical, and I see my time has come up already, where the cases where there's almost an incentive for, and I'm not saying that there is, I'm just saying on the, on the face of it, there's an incentive for not things to move at an exp expedited basis because um, you have a pretty good fee there that's guaranteed to be paid for the there, period of time. There's an inherent conflict of interest in yeah. the way the statute. Um, which Madoff investors are eligible for their CIPIC insurance? Uh, Congressman, let me, let me just say that um, this is, a, and it shouldn't be such a difficult issue, but it is, and of course it's a very heartbreaking issue, because the tragic truth is there is not enough money available to pay off all the customer claims. Um, and as you point out, there well, are... That, that leads, if I could just interject there, a larger problem, because that means that our citizens are not entitled to have confidence in the system. Ms. Chaitlin's written statement at page 17 uh, says that the trustee in Madoff has already sued several elderly, virtually destitute investors. Ms. Chaitlin is a vigorous advocate, but she's factually incorrect. The Madoff trustee has used the avoiding powers granted him by SIPA and the bankruptcy code judiciously. He has not sued small investors. My name is Adele Fox. I am a Bernard Madoff victim. Because I want to express everything I feel, 
I prefer to read a statement I have prepared. I am a widow, 86 years old, worked all of my life. My husband was a teacher in the New York City school system. We lived frugally so that we could save for our retirement. Most unexpectedly, he died in 1986 because for many years he was exposed to asbestos in the walls of his classroom. After his death, I moved to Florida. A few months ago, I was subpoenaed to submit my records. Unfortunately, I only had records going back to 1999 and therefore could not prove how much I put in. And Mr. Pickett knows this. I have doubts as to how he determined what my initial investments were and the accuracy of his records. This past November, Irving Pickard sent two letters. These are the letters. I am so distressed that I cannot sleep and my health is deteriorating. I have just been diagnosed with bleeding ulcers and irritable bowel syndrome. I am an emotional wreck and do not believe I can cope with this torture much longer. I have done nothing wrong. How can this happen in this country? How can Mr. Pickard be allowed to persecute innocent elderly people who are struggling terribly with declining health and now a very serious financial situation? At the December 9th congressional hearing, Mr. Harbeck stated that he would not go after people like me. Obviously not so in my case and how many other cases. To me, um Professor Coffey, that one of the problems here is there's a certain amount of money and we're sort of backing our coverage into that amount of money as opposed to creating... I mean, it's again, underfunded, you're quite right. Right, the law is the law and if, there happens to, if it happens to be underfunded then there ought to be an assessment or some, some way of making the people whole. Not say, well it's not 500,000 because we don't have enough cash in the bank to make this thing whole. And, and again, I just go back to how important it is, how strategic and, and, and essential it is for the public to know that if they invest, that the money, there is a fund there to protect them if there's fraud, insolvency, and those things out there. I think you're quite right. I want to make one little comment. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm just make one final statement, for will, because I may not be able to be here for the second panel of witnesses. I have real concerns about a trustee being able to receive $1 million a week in legal fees. And to me, it's an encouragement for him to keep litigation going, to go after Now, whether it is or not, whether, let's assume he's acting totally honorably. The fact is, it does put an appearance of evil, if you will, an appearance of a conflict of interest there to pay someone for the more energetic he is in going after one class of victims. I want to re repeat myself on the comments that I made earlier, that we're obviously not looking necessarily for fairness, because I don't know that you can get fairness, but what we're looking for with the folks here is, is, is justice and reliance that they made, um, not on independent investment decisions that they were uh, making in the normal course of things, but on their reliance on what the government uh, assured them through uh, um, both through this program after the fact and uh, through the assurances that these being registered and, and the fund, uh, his fund coming under the SEC as well. Thank you. Uh, General Lee from California. You're, this is a shell game that you're playing with investors who have, I mean, this is, this is over the, the, the heads of most of the people on, on, on our committee, I would think, how, how this happened and that this is being done. People relied on you and, and, and they were let down and we have to all collectively figure out a way to make all of them as whole as we can make them. I guess what I'm getting to is, did you hear the uh, outrage of the panel that we had earlier this morning? Mr. And Chairman, I hear it every day. Okay, well, I have, I have to believe that that outrage was sincere and somewhat based on, but I think what I'm uh, particularly disturbed about this whole uh, last 15, 18 month disaster that we've been in is an attitude at the governmental level or quasi-governmental level that it's not our problem. We don't have to take preventative steps, investigative steps. And I think you do. It, it is a, our problem. It's the committee's problem. It's the Congress's problem. It's the president's problem. Uh, you know, we, we just, as a matter of course, cannot accept in this country that some people feel that their government left them down, wrongly so.